Welcome to the fifth video in this review of basic Greek morphology based on 12 core patterns. We now conclude our review of third declension nouns. Pattern 5 presents us with the most complex set of third declension patterns and pattern 6 has the easiest. We don't have any new endings. These final two patterns continue to use the same core pattern as the first four patterns of the third declension. In the first four patterns we saw modifications of these basic endings because consonants were being added to consonants. Now we'll have stem endings and vowels, so we'll see modifications due to vowel contraction when endings with vowels are added to the stems. And you see that there are several of these endings that begin with vowels. So you need to become familiar with the common forms of contraction. This set of vowel contractions is one of the core patterns to learn. This list is arranged in the order in which you see signals in a text. So if you see an eta and suspect it represents a contraction, then you expect it to have come from epsilon plus alpha. The first item in the list may look a little strange. What it means is that when a stem ends in alpha and an epsilon is added, it remains in alpha even though there's often a change in accent. Not all these forms of contraction occur in the third declension, but we'll meet them in the verbal system as well. So here's the pattern to learn in general. Another major feature in pattern 5 third declensions is a stem shift. In other words, the stem ending is not the same throughout the paradigm. And we're going to see three different forms that this stem shift can take. And that will cover the most important patterns for this sort of third declension. In each of these sub-patterns within pattern 5, the stem is usually an epsilon, but in the nominative singular and some other forms, it has a different ending. So we'll watch for that as we go through. So here's our first pattern, and you can see it's using the neuter endings. In this pattern, the stem shift is between an omicron sigma in the nominative and accusative singular and an epsilon elsewhere. The zero form in the nominative and accusative singular means that os is not modified. So os will look like the ending, and it will be a nominative singular, just like it is in the second declension patterns, but it's in a neuter pattern, and so the accusative singular also ends in os, because the actual ending is a zero form. The endings on the dative singular and plural and the genitive plural are all recognizable, but in all the other forms, the epsilon stem contracts with the vowel in the ending and has some new letters. So you can learn this pattern as if it's a new and distinct form of third declension, os, us, a, os, and so forth. But if you understand how the pattern is formed, you can learn to recognize the endings using the rules of vowel contraction and the basic set of endings in the core pattern. Pay special attention to the genitive singular, us, and the nominative and accusative plural, eta, since they look like endings in the first and second declensions. So let's look at some examples and passages. Here the ending points to a dative plural, and the article confirms that. When you're looking up a third declension word in a lexicon, the key is the stem ending. And from the ending, we know we're dealing with a third declension, and then we see that the stem is epsilon. And when the stem ending is an epsilon, we expect the nominative singular to shift. And so far we've only seen one shift, and so we're going to expect that to be a shift to an omicron sigma. So here we see the omicron sigma in the nominative form, and the genitive form shows us we're dealing with the third declension pattern, not the second declension, as does the article ta. If this were second declension, that would be an u and a ha in the lexicon. Now, if you think this form is a feminine of the first declension, then when you look it up, you'll discover it doesn't exist because you look up ete and that form is not in the lexicon. So you need to remember at that point that this could also be a contraction from an epsilon stem with an alpha ending in the third declension, in which case we expect the lemma to have a stem shift. And again, we only know one of them so far, so we expect to find etos. And that's what we do find. Now these patterns are not irregular, so the lexicons of Danker and Newman won't help you if you come across one of these forms and you can't make sense out of it. The websites Perseus and BibleHub.com would give you the parsings, though as well as some other print resources I mentioned in using and enjoying Biblical Greek. Our second form of pattern 5, we see a stem shift between an iota and an epsilon. And these are going to be feminine nouns. The nominative singular has the iota stem ending and uses sigma as its ending. The accusative singular now uses the new ending. Genitive singular calls for special attention since the omicron sigma now has been lengthened to an omega sigma. 
it's probably easiest just to learn aos as a genitive singular third declension ending, but seeing it as a lengthening of the regular omicron sigma may help you remember it. Note the accusative plural now uses the second option in the basic pattern, epsilon sigma. That means that the nominative and accusative plural forms of these words are identical, and that can cause problems at times in parsing, especially since the ace ending also shows up as a verbal ending. So if you remember this pattern has this feature, you can be alert for the possibility and watch for clues in the context as to whether you're dealing with a nominative or accusative plural. Here in Jude 7, the definite article hi helps, and the ace points to an epsilon stem that's been contracted, and so you expect it to go back to either os or is, since we now have two endings for the nominative that we're working with. And polis is the form that you'll find. Here in Matthew 9, the article, tas, points to the accusative plural parsing. That ending could be either nominative or accusative plural, but the article here sorts it out. So for pattern 5b, pay special attention to the eos for the genitive singular ending and the ace that can be either a nominative or accusative plural ending. Our final paradigm for pattern 5 has a shift between epsilon, upsilon, and epsilon in the stem for these masculine nouns. Again, we see atos in the genitive singular. Now both the dative and accusative singulars show the basic ending clearly. And in the plural, the forms follow the same routine we saw in 5b, though now with the stem ending in epsilon, upsilon in the dative plural. So the two main features for special attention in 5b also go for 5c. Atos in the genitive singular, and ace as both a nominative and accusative plural ending. As you seek to become familiar with pattern 5, go through the three patterns and note what the endings look like and correlate them with the basic endings of the core pattern and hopefully that will help you learn to recognize them more easily. Now the other bit of information you need when reading is getting back to the lemma. The easiest way to deal with that issue that I've found is to memorize the nominative singular endings that these words can take. So I recommend that you memorize os, us, is, els, ace or os, us, is, us, ace. Two of these endings, the us and the ace, we haven't met yet. They'll be on third declension adjectives that we'll look at in the next video. So when you think you're dealing with a third declension form with these stem shifts and vowel contraction, then look in the lexicon under the stem with these endings on it and you should have no trouble spotting the correct word. So here brephus might look like a second declension, accusative plural, but apa only takes a genitive so that might point in the right direction right away. If you look for a pattern 5 third declension using the five nominative endings, you'd expect to find one of these forms. And when you go to the lexicon, the correct word is very clear. In this case, even if you mistakenly thought it was a second declension noun, you'd find the form brephos, and then you'd discover from the lexicon that this is a third declension because of the genitive and the article. And then that would help you sort out the correct parsing for the form in the text. So that concludes the major examples of this type of third declension pattern. Between the vowel contraction and the stem shifts, it has my vote for one of the most difficult patterns to learn in Greek. But seeing how each of these three sub-patterns relates to our core pattern of the indefinite pronoun may help you learn these endings more easily. The main point is to be able to recognize them in a text. Our final third declension pattern has a stem in upsilon, and the stem doesn't shift, and there's no modifications to the basic endings. The only thing you might note is that diaresis in the date of singular signaling that the yoda ending is a separate vowel and not part of a diphthong. So we end with a very easy pattern really. So here's a summary of what we've seen in this video. We've seen third declension nominals, in particular the nouns, with stems ending in a vowel. And we've seen three forms of stem shift and then a fourth form that doesn't have a shift. On the website, I've posted a summary of these six patterns of the third declension with the tricks for getting back to the lemma. Now that we've seen the six main patterns of the third declension, in the next video we'll see how these patterns for the nouns are applied to the adjectives.